Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Phil Chang, and we're going to be discussing myopia in Australia, axial length changes, and the effects of myopia from COVID on the Myopia Podcast. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Philip Cheng uh, out of Australia. How are you today, my friend? Yes, yeah, I'm good, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks very much for inviting me here today, David. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be on your show. Yeah. Well, Phil and I were just uh, talking about uh, the Myopia podcast, and he's had a chance to, to listen to some of the episodes. It's been something I've been wanting to connect with you and get you on the show, but mm. there's this darn time zone change. I mean, we're on different days and different times, and yeah, uh, yeah. I think you're recording early in the morning, and I'm late uh, in the Eight o'clock here this morning. Right? I've got my coffee with me, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very cool. Well, why don't you uh, share with everybody a little bit about uh, y- your practice, where you practice, and um, and uh, and what you do? I, you, you've got a big name in the myopia world that you've created oh, for yourself. Right. Okay, thank you. Tell us how, uh, how you share in the myopia world for those people who don't know you. Which okay, sure. So yeah, my name's people um, do. <laughs> so I'm Philip. So I practice in uh, in Melbourne, Australia. So I run a independent practice in Kew East, which is about uh, 15 kilometers from the central city of Melbourne. Um, so we started this clinic about five years ago now um, in, in a smaller space. Um, so, you know, over time that's uh, grown quite a, quite substantially. Now we've moved to, to a new clinic here um, down the road and it's about three times bigger than it used to be. And I've got a lot more staff as well. So it's a lot more support for me. And um, over the last few years with the COVID as well, um, there's just been such growth in the myopia space here and a lot more awareness of um, the management options that are available for kids now um, referrals from from parents and other practitioners and yeah this the whole thing is just um, really growing substantially now does your practice do all forms of uh, of eye care or is it just myopia so we actually do um, general eye care as well, yeah. But yeah. we are very well known for sort of myopia management and pediatrics and um, also K fitting. So yeah, even though we, we do see adults, and we know there's a lot of questions um, we get asked by by parents, are uh, do we, we actually see adult patients as well? And yes, we do. We do actually right. fully equipped to see adults too. But you know, we're just um, a little bit more focused on, on myopia. Well, how did how did that happen? How how over five years have you? come to be known as a myopia practice what got you there okay look I guess guess the whole journey started in about 2016 so at that time there was a um, seminar run by the Brian Holden Institute in Sydney the myopia event it was called at that time so um, it's a series of lectures um, at the the University of New South Wales so I attended that and uh, at that point I realized that um, that this um, there's there's definitely uh, opportunity to to do more for kids with myopia, and at that time I was working in in corporate practice and you know, felt a little bit limited to what offers we can offer. So from that moment I was really motivated to do more. Um, and being very high myope myself, I'm minus eight. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, it'd be great to be able to help more kids and prevent the t- type of progression that it, um, was happening. Yeah. Yeah, so so that kind of spurred you on that something's got to be different. And then yes. was with the thought mm-hmm. of myopia what led you to start your own practice? Yeah, so you know, so I've kind of always dreamt about having my own practice, but um, you know, starting a practice from from scratch is always um, very difficult. Mm-hmm. And I guess finding a niche that I was passionate about and interested in um, really drove me to to do more and to develop a clinic that was very specialized in in um, in doing myopia management. Hmm. Interesting. Now, um, your practice started off as, you know, all, all things. And then how, mm. how did you get to be known? How did you market so that this was something that people ended up finding you and, you know, mm. to develop the myopia clinic? Sure. I guess um, the growth of the clinic comes from a lot of it's to do with word of mouth, as, as you hear about um, from, you know, happy parents and, and patients. And they just kind of um, spread the word about what we do. Obviously, um, you know, education for practitioners, um, I'm quite involved in as well. Um, the Facebook pages, um, you know, just helping other practitioners and 
you know, sharing my experience. I think that's really important. And you know, listening to all the podcasts here, though, helps me to learn as well and share knowledge. And that's such an important part of what we do. Um, and also, of course, the developing a good website with good information for, for parents. Um, all those things will, will matter. Yeah, I would say the majority of, of our patients are sort of referred by sort of ex existing patients and um, some by practitioners and then others just come from, from, from the website. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would encourage people to check out your websites. You've done a great job of oh, thank you. Some <laughs> inviting information to draw people in. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, about COVID. I mean, two of the five years that you've had your practice have been mm. during two and a half during COVID. And it's you told me that you, a year ago you moved into this new space, you know, mm. a lot bigger and so forth. What's, uh, you know, I think we all have seen that COVID has grown during, myopia has grown during COVID, <laughs> but what are some of the things that you've picked up on? So look, um, no, COVID obviously, obviously was a, uh quite challenging uh, for many people and uh, all, all across the world. And in Melbourne, we actually had the, the longest lockdown period in the whole world. So, oh, yeah. Really? Tell yeah, me Yeah, more. something like 182 days or something, which is oh, crazy over the two-year period. What do you mean by lockdown? Let's get that. So there were, there were restrictions on, on what we could do, um, how much outdoor time we could have, um, you know, one hour per day for exercise or, you know, two trips to go shopping and things like that. And, you know, very, very limited um, movement, basically. Yeah, it um, makes it very had... difficult to get kids outside for two hours a day, right? <laughs> it was very difficult. Yeah, exactly. And what they also had about uh, three terms of remote learning as well over those two years. Um, so all those things contributed to massive increases in myopia um, progression. Yeah. Have you uh, been able to track that at all? Have you, uh, obviously you see patients, but it's difficult to always track that with numbers and so forth. Is there yeah. something that you've seen in that arena? Oh, well, we certainly have. Well, in terms of patient growth is, you know, after, after the lockdowns and the patient came in for the routine eye test and it's like, you know, some of them had progressed by a diopter, two diopters in a year, massive oh. increases. We had a lot of referrals from, from, um, from other patients as well, um, we had kids who were already uh, we already had axial length measurements from from prior prior COVID, and some of them just grew so much. Like you could mm. you could see the axial length changed by like you know, like a millimeter. Wow, massive amounts. Yeah, that's a, that's incredible for those of us yep. who may not be really gauging what uh, what axial length changes are normal. As normal, we would see a 0.1 to 0.2. Well, yeah, exactly. 0.1 to 0.2 per year. Yeah. Mm. So that's incredible. So that leads us into axial length being something mm. that obviously is a big part of your practice. So how how do how will you incorporate uh, axial length in in the management of your myopia for your patients? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, axial length is certainly it's a very very important part of my practice. Um, we've had it um, for about four years now. We've um, you know had a, a few different biometers, and um, now we're using the RL Master Five Hundred and also the um, Myopia Master. We have two machines here. Um, so look, basically without axial length measurements, I wouldn't be able to practice the way I do. It, it, it's mm. that important. Yeah. Um, Why do so, you use two machines? <clears throat> so no, we've, we've used the OL Master 500 for, for quite a while, um, okay. but um, it's, it's the new technologies that have improved. No, um, we've introduced a new machine last year. So we oh, started cool. moving patients to the, to the new platform, which is a little bit more integrated into, into the software in the practice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it was, it so, was a nice uh, graphs uh, and all that. Hmm. Are 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 you finding that since you have the two machines that you're kind of mm. curious if there's if there's synergy between them? Do you kind of take yeah, one well, we do. And, well, master and, then, <laughs> and then see if there's differences? What are if you what differences? Are you yeah, they're actually pr pretty close. So I wow. would say look, okay, no, no, no two machines are going to be exactly the same. It also depends on so patient fixation and all that. Um, but generally within 0.05 millimeters uh, the measurements, yeah, pretty close. So yeah, we uh, you know our intention is uh, we have we have multiple offices in my practice, and mm. that's one of the questions is if we don't have the exact same machine, mm -hmm. can you go back and forth? And you know we have patients yeah. who go to both offices, mm. so good to know that there is yeah. uh, there is synergy between those. Two. Yeah, yeah, pretty close. Sometimes I take you know the measurements on, on the same patient on both machines on the same day, so I just kind of to validate the data. But particular patients who had the same machine all along, just going kind to of make mm. sure. It correlates mm -hmm. well, yeah. And you've had the Myopia Master for how long? About a year? About uh, 12 months now. Wow, okay. Yeah, yeah. but so we're starting to use it. Hmm. We're still starting to use it more and more now, yeah. Yeah, 
For those people who don't mm. know about the myopia master, it does auto refraction, keratometry, mm -hmm. HVID, mm -hmm. and axial length. And then mm. and, and also pupil software. size. Mm. Yep, pu uh, pupil size. Mm. And then mm. it's got software, right? So tell us That's about right, that yeah. software. Mm -hmm. We're not we're not on a commercial for myopia master mm. but just kind of tell us about that software so basically it just uh, it plots the axial length changes over time so it can pro projects a nice graph for the parents to see and also percent percentile lines so to see where the child forms into in, in terms of their um you know if their their eyeballs you know shorter or longer than than average and uh sort of gauge their risk factors yeah yeah so mm. that allows you to then somewhat customize mm. some of your approaches. And what one of the things I oftentimes see that's a bit of a struggle for people is they may be doing myopia management with their patients and the, the kiddos come back and they've progressed. And the question kind of comes is, is mm. that a normal progression for that kid mm -hmm. or is there something we need to do more aggressively? If you have kids mm. that are coming back and they're progressing a little faster than what you would expect, mm. What kind of changes do you make? What do you think about? What are your go-tos? Mm. Always sure. dependent on the kid, but right? Yeah. So I think look, from the onset, we, we've got to be very realistic with the parents as well, you know, just to make sure their expectations are in line with what we're expecting from our, from our treatments because the, no, no treatment is 100% effective as we know and is also very patient dependent. Um, so you know, basically, we, we always measure axial length at every visit, at baseline and uh, when you start first start the treatment, say one month, three months, six months, et cetera. And we, we basically want the axial length change to, to sort of resemble what normal growth would look like. So between 1.1 1 .1 to 0.2 millimeters per year. Mm -hmm. So we're still starting to see you know, increases in in the, basically the, the slope of the graph in the, is very really indicative of the of the growth pattern. Um, so if we've seen too, you know, the line being a little bit too steep, then we're starting to think, you know, we, are we achieving our outcomes here? Should we do a little bit more? And that's the point when we start talking talking to parents about, okay, so we we are on a myopia management plan now. It seems to be going okay, but there's potential to that we could possibly do more. So, for example, if they on on ortho K and their lens are working well, there's no problems, but they're still progressing. Then we can start looking at maybe doing combinations of treatments, adding a little bit of atropine, 0.01, 0.02 percent, just a low dose, um, and that seems to enhance the ortho-K effect. And it's been shown in evidence as well that combination therapies do work better than monotherapy. Yeah. There's been mm. several papers that have proven that, right? Ortho-K mm. by itself, atropine by itself mm. has an additive effect and even slows mm. it down. And there was just another study that was just recently published mm. that showed that exactly. very thing of the importance mm. of it. Um, so I, I agree. That's, that's an approach we go as we do multiple therapy, a little mm. controversial in some ways is that a lot of patients that are progressing fast mm. when they're referred to our clinic, we initiate dual therapy on them right from the beginning. Mm. Yep. And that's in our intention to drop that progression as quickly mm. as we can. Yep. We can always take somebody mm. off a of treatment, that's but we right, can yeah. never shrink their eye, right? Exactly. You can always so, reduce treatment, yeah. but <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with that approach. You know, if a child came in 26.5 millimeter I, um, you know, minus five, minus six, and age, you know, you know, between eight to 12, look, they're, they're high, very high risk. And we know, you know younger kids progress more rapidly. So we do need to treat them harder and more aggressively than the older kids. And, you know, I certainly agree that sometimes I do put them on dual treatment straight away. Yeah. 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 Um, what else is forefront of your mind in the myopia space, mm. uh, in 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 particularly in Australia? Right? What's uh, what's on? Uh, what have you been thinking about? Oh, look, um, I'm look. Uh, we're very very lucky in Australia to have so many options available to us. Like, uh, we we're, we're not sort of sort of bound by FDA approval things like that. So we've got the whole range of um, contact lens options, orthokeratology spectacle lens options, atropine, the, the work. So we're extremely lucky to have everything here already. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Um, you know, obviously there's, there's new um, products in the pipeline. You know, Essilor haven't released a Stellar lens here yet. Um, that apparently is coming by the end of the year. Um, mm -hmm. So that's exciting to have more, more spectacle lens options. At the moment, I'm using the Hoyer Myo Smart, which has been very effective for a lot of kids as well. Um, and also um, new contact lens products, such as the um, ability from Johnson Johnson, Yes, yeah. um, on its way. Um, you know, currently, I'm using the MySight lens, and I've been using that for the last five years with really good outcomes. Um, so, yeah, it's, and what I'm excited about excited about is uh, having more options for for different kids, 
and um, yeah, and seeing how they work. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your your decision to to, to go into myopia management with a child. Um, what uh, you know is is there something you kind of prefer? Or uh, is it something you use more often? What direction do you go initially with most of the children? Sure. Okay. So I like to run through all the options of the parents at first. So I wanted them to, to understand that uh, you know, there are broadly four different options available to them, mm -hmm. um, three of them being optical treatments and one um, pharmaceutical. Um, because I don't want to leave anything on the table. Then they, they, you know, they want, I want them to fully understand what we've got. Um, so then um, I... I would usually tell them that um, orthokeratology, myositis, and myosis are generally roughly the same in according according to the literature. Okay, so roughly about a fifty percent, fifty sixty percent reduction of of progression. And I'll use my experience then to to try to guide them through um, which path to take. So you know, you, you would sort of base that on the um, the, the level of myopia, that the risk factors. You know, do they play sports? Would they prefer to wear glasses or contact lenses? Are they ready for contact lenses? So it's not necessarily the age of a child, um, but sort of their readiness to, to wear contact lenses. I generally find that contact lenses tend to give us a better result. Um, that, you know, that could be a compliance factor, or it could be just because the lenses are you know, right on the eye surface, that there's no sort of um, movement of the glass that's been you know, affecting the efficacy as well. So contact lenses tend to be my preferred option, uh, but it really then depends on um, how, how the child is and then the parents, um, and what they say about that contact lens options. Yeah. Mm. What um what leads you in the direction of a spectacle lens? We don't have spectacles mm. in mm -hmm. the United States. Uh, we do sure. in Canada. But what what, mm. what would lead you to go that direction? Sure. So basically, look, um, if the, if the child's um very adamant, you know, that they don't want to wear contact lenses, just mm. you know, and you, and you know them um yeah. pretty quickly. You know, have you kind of yeah. you have struggled put that you know. Uh, dilation drops into their eyes, for example, it's going to be rather challenging in contact lens in their eye. And, yeah. and also, though, that, that some, some, some parents are um, a little bit um, worried about uh, of contact lens at the beginning. Okay. So they, they, some, a lot of them gradually warm to the idea as well. So it just really just depends. Um, you know, spectacle lens options I would basically generally use on, on younger kids. Yeah. Younger kids, maybe first time myopes, lower prescriptions, where they would just get them started on myopia management. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's mm. um that's really a key component I think that so many of us are 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 missing is reflecting on all of those different options and how do we how do we uh, compartmentalize them? I think there's a lot of practices that are just kind of starting in myopia management, and I'm so happy that they're doing this. Is mm. that they may put everybody in one treatment, right? Mm. Having the whole toolkit really allows us to get more and more and more of our patients started. Mm, what about, exactly. you know, one of, mm. one of my observations that I think is the case with Australia is that more practitioners are open to myopia management than mm. maybe in other parts of the world. Do you mm. find that to be the case? Is that an accurate uh, um, understanding of, of, of the profession in Australia? I would, I would say um, a lot of practitioners here are, are now um, yeah, open and warm to the idea of myopia management. Obviously, we still see kids who are wearing single vision lenses with no yeah. management, but um, it seems to be that uh, we, we're talking about it more. So that's uh, that's fantastic. Um, it, it might be to do with it, uh, the amount of education that we do in the myopia space as well for practitioners. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, and there's a lot of um, you know, good practitioners in, in this country as well. You know, Dr. Kate, Kate Gifford who runs a myopia profile. Yeah, I mean, all the work that she does, you know, it's fantastic and driving yeah. awareness. Yeah. Yeah, that is a, a a really incredible thing with the Brian Holden Institute and and uh, Kate's program. There is a lot mm. of education. I, I'm sure that they, they support all of us around the world, but I, I would mm. hope that okay. <laughs> that really is helpful for in the in, in Australia as well. Well, that's fantastic. Are uh, are we going to be seeing you at the uh, 2022 Vision by Design meeting by chance? Uh, not this year, unfortunately. Not this year. I know you're a travel. fellow of the, uh, of, of the uh, Academy, which yes, I think I am, is a fantastic yeah. thing. And you've contributed a lot to the organization over the years. But uh, yeah. I really appreciate your perspectives, uh, you know, have been a big fan of the work that you've done. You put out mm -hmm. great education for those of us that are in the space with your writing and your contributions mm -hmm. and so forth. 
So um, it's been awesome to get to hang out with you and chat with oh, you. Oh, that's, that's you fantastic. Thanks, yeah, thanks so much for having me here. But there's so much more that we could, we could uh, really talk about, I think. Yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> We're going to have to do this again. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank yep. you. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you again next time on the Myopia Podcast. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.